turn in your Bibles, if you will, to uh, the book of Hebrews and hold that spot for just a moment. I want to speak to you this morning on the risen hope. <clears throat> the psalmist advised in Psalm 42, 5, he said, Hope thou in God. We actually have that up here on the back wall of our church. And when returning to their land, the people of Israel had been in Babylonian captivity. And so Ezra and Nehemiah left them, uh, let them back. Ezra to rebuild the temple, Nehemiah to rebuild the walls. And uh, the people under Ezra made this statement in Ezra chapter 10, verse 2. They said, yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this saying. This was after they told Ezra they were going to repent of their sins and start serving the Lord again. Because they were in captivity because of their disobedience. In speaking prophetically of his own death, burial, and resurrection, the Savior says this in Psalm 16, 9 and 10. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth, my flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave thy, my soul in hell, neither suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Peter, in his Pentecost address in Acts chapter 2, uh, actually quoted this passage of Scripture. David would later declare this in Psalm 31, 24. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. They believe that a Levite may have written Psalm 119, and he says several things. Let me give you a few of them from Psalm 119. Verse 49, remember the word upon which thou hast caused me to hope. Psalm 119, verse 81 my soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Psalm 119, verse 114, again says, I hope in thy word. Uh, three other Psalms, 130, verse 7, 146, verse 5, and 131, verse 3, say this, hope in the Lord. Well, the resurrection is guaranteed. When a person is resurrected to, however, is going to be determined by the decisions he makes here on this earth. Proverbs 14, 32 gives this warning. The wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous hath hope in his death. And the word righteous here does not refer to a person who did a lot of good deeds and lived a good life and all of that, but it refers to a person who has a status based upon his personal faith in Christ, having experienced the new birth. Jeremiah 17, 7 says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. In uh, Acts chapter 24, beginning in verse 13, the apostle Paul has been called to testimony before Felix and Drusilla. <clears throat> and in... Uh, Acts 24, beginning in verse 13, listen to what he says. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, the way referring to Christians during that period of time, but after the way they call heresy, which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and I have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me. Or else let these same that are here say, if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council, except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, am I called into question by you this day? And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. 
And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintances to minister or to come unto him. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning his faith in Christ. Well, the apostle Paul preached the resurrection. As a matter of fact, if you go through the book of Acts and then you read the rest of the New Testament, you'll find the resurrection was central to everything that the apostles preached. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. In both the Old and New Testaments, the whole idea of hope is viewed in a certain way based upon God's promises and Jesus promised a resurrection. But it's not viewed that way by our culture in a modern United States. People today, even some Christians, use the word hope as a synonym for wish. Let me give you a couple of examples. I've, I've heard these over and over again. I hope it doesn't snow. I hope my children serve the Lord. I hope the COVID-19 COVID virus will not hit my home. I hope my CAT scan doesn't show that I have cancer. I hope my deployed military husband will come home soon. I hope, I hope, I hope. So it's a synonym for most people of wish. And that's the shallowest concept of hope that there is. And it is totally the opposite of how hope is used in the scriptures. In both the Old and New Testaments, hope refers to something that is certain, something that is permanent, something that is already secured for us and available simply by trusting God and His Word. So I want to solidify the concept of hope, the hope that we have in Christ, by reading you a passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to look at several different things that are mentioned in that passage and try to demonstrate to you that the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees us a permanence in eternity beyond this. But it's not granted to everyone. A lot of people have the idea, misconception, that just because Jesus died on the cross, everybody in the world is going to go to heaven. Of course, that's not what the Bible teaches. But turn there to Hebrews chapter 6. Let me begin reading in verse 13, and I'll go through verse 20, and then we'll go back and look at the various things, and I'll give you an outline from that passage. So beginning in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, God swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation or hope, who had fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope which is set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Well, I want to give you an outline from this passage to help us see what we're doing here, and what, what kind of hope we actually have. First of all, number one, let's look at the promises. Who's doing the promising here? This is our God, we're told in verse 13. He swear by himself. In other words, what he's about to say is based upon his unchangeable character. But then let's look secondly at the promise. Blessing, I will bless thee, verse 14. This promise started out for Abraham, but God included in it a what I call a multi-lined uh, prophecy which means that all nations would benefit eventually from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what our security is based upon. That's why we have hope. So the promiser, the promise, let's look at those promised. To whom did he make this promise? While initially God promised Abraham, 
If you look at the context of Genesis 12, 1 through 3, God also included a blessing which extended to Abraham. He said, in Abraham, Abraham shall all nations of the earth be blessed. So we have the promiser, the promise, the promised, and then the plan. Let's look at number four, the plan. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, the Apostle Paul, who had been a Jew in line to take over Gamaliel's position as the chief rabbi of Israel, came to Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 9 on that road to Damascus. Here's what he wrote to the Galatian church in chapter 3, verse 8. He says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. That was the plan. God says the plan can't be just for the Jews because he knew they would reject the Messiah. The, this uh, concept that they were the chosen people of God was driven across to them over and over, but they tended to cast it aside. And God knew the international need of salvation, and he brought Jesus to the world to save all. That was the plan. The plan was John 3.16. But then number five, look at the patience. It's interesting when you see what's happening in history and then as you read the Bible, you find that God operates on his schedule, not ours. God proceeds on his will, not ours. Notice what he says in Hebrews 6.15. After he, Abraham, had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. In other words, the Savior was eventually introduced that special night in a stable in Bethlehem. Years ago, I had the privilege to go to that very location, and I knelt and prayed there. The ultimate step in God's plan would be fulfilled in the life of that baby, the incarnate Son of God. The patience. Abraham patiently waited for the promise. How amazing is that? The eternal God made a commitment to Abraham and through Abraham to all of his descendants and then he confirmed it by an oath based upon the fact that he held an unchanging God. That promise had to be backed by power sufficient to bring it to pass. Nothing would be able to stop God from doing what he intended to do. So that brings me to number six, the power. God said, I will bless thee. Because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show the immutability of his own counsel, confirmed it by an oath. You know, when Paul was converted, he began spreading the gospel that he had originally hated. And in his letter to the churches in Rome, he comforted believers by this reference to God's power in Romans 8.31. Listen to it. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? God's promises are always backed by God's power. However, those promises are also backed by God's character. Verses 17 and 18 in the 6th chapter says, Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who had fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. So let's look at a few things in that, those Two verses there. First of all, let's look at the phrase, the immutability of his counsel. Immutability is a Greek word which means unchangeable. It comes from a word uh, which has the negative particle associated with it. It says, it can't be transported away. Can't be changing sides, moving from one side to another. And cannot be perverted or distorted. The immutability of his counsel. Once God says something, we can trust it. The word counsel is interesting because it's a Greek word that deals with volition. It deals with will. So God's will is dominant. His nature is not to change his will. His nature is not to change his purpose. 
Well, to further strengthen the notion that his promise will be carried out, we're told in verse 17 he confirmed it by an oath. The word confirmed is an interesting word. It has legal origin. It means to ratify something, to confirm the status of something and operate on that. Two things are immutable. First, that God cannot lie. And secondly, that he confirmed his promise by an oath. So God's character is an unlying character, and when he makes an oath, we can trust the oath. This, for us, is the greatest sense of security. That's what our hope is based on. Our hope is not, we're not using the word hope like the world does. I hope it doesn't snow. I, I hope my dogs jump a fox. I, you know, I hope uh, they start serving chocolate milkshakes again. You know, it, it, that's not what God's talking about. He's talking about something secured, and it's secured by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at number seven. I call this the product. What is the result of this process that God has worked on over history? What is the result of this process based upon who God is and what God said? Verse 18 says, We have great consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. So we who have trusted Christ as our Savior are linked by the finished work of Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, to the most secure of all possible hopes. And we're told of this hope, what we're told about it. Listen to what we're told about it, Hebrews 6, 18. It provides refuge. I love that word. The Greek word means a place available for us to go into, a place that is surrounded by protection, a refuge. It provides refuge. Secondly, this hope we have enables laying hold on consolation. He says the word lay hold means to seize, to retain, to put our full strength behind holding on to. And then the word hope is that common Greek word, not like wish, but it's a word that indicates a confident thing, a certain thing. And the definite article is assigned to the word hope frequently. And the definite article refers to it as a specific hope. And the apostles in the book of Acts refer to it as the hope of the resurrection from the dead. So it provides refuge, hope does. It enables laying hold on. And thirdly, it is the hope that is set before us. This word means somebody comes and places something in plain view and then leads to us the opportunity to decide to accept it or reject it. It's set before us. God's not going to force us to believe in Jesus Christ as our sacrifice. He's not going to force us to believe that he rose from the dead. But he's going to say, here it is. What are you going to do about it? The interesting thing about it is what you do with that message determines whether or not you're going to participate in an eternal hope or not. And then number four, it's called an anchor of the soul. This Greek word almost sounds like our word, ankara. It was used of a ship's anchor. And it indicated uh, stabilizing something and keeping it from drifting as a result of the tides. You and I need something to keep us from drifting when the tides of life put pressure on us. And he says that this is an anchor for the soul. And this is the, this is the word not for biological life, but for supernatural life. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, to the fullest. So he's talking here about a hope that is irrevocable and you certainly don't want to miss this. Your life security depends upon with whom you are anchored to. So he, he says not only is it does it provide a refuge, not only is it laid hold of, not only is it set before us, not only is it an anchor, but again he says it is both sure and steadfast. Two words that are linked 
in order to give emphasis here. The word sure, unfailing, secure, certain, safe. And then the word steadfast means stable, firm, sure, steadfast, set. So the whole idea is that this hope we have, we don't have to worry about this anchor breaking away. What a hope we have in Christ, both sure and steadfast. Then another thing about this hope, he says, he says, which entereth into that within the veil. And in verses 19 and 20, he says, which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. And then he explains what he means by that. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Well, I had the privilege years ago to study at Dallas Seminary to study under most of the men who wrote the textbooks for almost all Christian colleges. One of those men was Zane Hodges. Zane Hodges was a firm believer in the Textus Receptus. In the Greek classes I took from him, we had to use the Textus Receptus. We didn't use the Nestle's text. But here's what Zane Hodges has to say about verses 19 and 20. And he's listed in the Bible Knowledge Commentary. Here's what he says. That anchor has been carried to the safest point of all. The inner sanctuary behind the curtain by Jesus who went before us. Where he functions now as a high priest forever. Where he has given to Christians... Hope and anchorage from which it cannot be shaken loose. End of quotation. So our hope is secure, irreversible, unshakable, permanent. Why? Because Jesus, who died, was buried, and rose again, entered the tabernacle of heaven with his own blood. Now, if you go to the ninth chapter, I love this passage in chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, listen to it. He talks about, in verses 1 through 10, he talks about how the blood of bulls and goats could provide the, the, uh, the Hebrew word for coverage. And people who died in the Old Testament and who believed the message delivered to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and all of those, they went into paradise. But then he says, when Christ came, something changed. Listen to what he says in Hebrews 9, beginning in verse 11. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctuary sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, how did all this come about? Well, if you want to find out how it all started, what you have to do is you have to go back to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. And what you have to do is you have to go to the last chapter in uh, Matthew. And in the last chapter, you begin reading in verse 1 and going through verse 8. And you find out how this hope was secured. Here it is. Matthew 28, 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon him. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. 
And then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples word. Well, that's how the hope was secured. The empty tomb. I stood outside that tomb in uh, the garden below Calvary. You can stand down by the tomb. You can look up and see Mount Calvary. And our guide showed us the tomb. And he said, it is believed by many archaeologists that this was the actual tomb in which the body of Jesus was buried. A British team now oversees that tomb. So they led us in to see the tomb. On the outside of the door, before they opened the door, was this sign. I know you seek Jesus. He is not here. He is risen, as he said. Just think about it. If Jesus had not risen from the dead, there would be no salvation. If Jesus had not risen from the dead, there would be no hope secured by his completed work, death, burial, and resurrection. Edward Mote wrote, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. You know, we have a strong hope, the hope of eternal life that comes from trusting Jesus alone to save us from our sin. Norman Clayton wrote, My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me and paid the price of all my sin at Calvary. Alfred Ackley wrote, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living no matter what men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Let's stand together for prayer. Father, thank you for the blessings that we receive through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We ask you to speak to our hearts this morning as we open the altar if anyone needs to come. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone who's living a hopeless life, that person will now say, yes, I believe Jesus died for me, and as much as I know how, I'm going to ask him to be my personal Savior. I'm going to turn from my sins and turn to the only hope I have, the Lord Jesus Christ. Speak to our hearts now as we sing in Jesus' name. Amen. What page? 273. 273 in your songbook. God spoke into your heart. The altar is open if you need to come for any reason whatsoever. Christ the Lord is risen. Amen.